And tonight we have uh, Bishop Lynch, Robert Lynch of St. Petersburg. You know that place in Florida. <laughs> but, but not many of our folks go to St. Petersburg during the winter. They're more Naples type. Oh, there's one that's going to St. Petersburg. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop Lynch and I have been friends for 30 years or so. Uh, we work together in Washington at the uh, Bishop's Conference and we have spent many a day on the high seas exploring different parts of the world. So it's a pleasure to welcome him here tonight and he's going to be speaking on the three popes, two of them with whom he worked very closely uh, on different projects and I'm sure he'll tell us some a bit about that. Even though it's, it's three popes, it's one church. Did I get anywhere close to the title? Yep, yeah. okay. that's fine. Okay. Uh, somehow, I feel that I'm sandwiched, no pun intended, as the bologna between two Republican slices of bread this evening. <laughs> and for those of you that um, want to get home to, to hear part two of the debates, I'll just use the great line of Henry VIII to his third wife, I won't keep you long. <laughs> If there's a thesis or a central theme to my remarks this evening, and I can assure you before I start that there, uh, there, the talk is full of hypotheses, but if there's a thesis, it would be simply this. The papacy is, a divinely, ins is divinely inspired and has been the glue which often held the church together through many challenging and difficult periods. I believe that I, and many of you as well, have been witnesses to this thesis, that the papacy is a gift from the Lord in our lifetimes. I'm old enough, and looking out at you, I think you are, as many of you are as well, to recall vividly in my lifetime seven popes, Pius XII, John XXIII, Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, Benedict, and now Francis. From my remarks tonight, I will exclude Pius XII, as I was only 18 when he died. And my memory can only recall what Pathé News, remember that when you went to the movies and they would show you a newsreel before television and radio, the only visible and visual things that we ever saw of the Pope were often on those newsreels at the movie theaters. And an embryonic television phenomenon was able to show and share with the world. John XXIII, in a very real way, changed my life. And he probably saved my faith. Though he was, much like Paul, like, much like Pius, a distant figure, as instant visual presence remained still in its infancy. Without the council which he called, I can pretty much tell you I wouldn't be here this evening. He was the animator, the gift, the change agent, feeling deeply within his very being and within his soul that if the church didn't open up its windows and let in fresh air, even more difficult days were ahead. Pope Paul VI stirred my imagination when he came to New York uninvited by our country, but at the invitation and at the behest of the United Nations. And I and you, probably those of us of age, will likely never forget that marvelous line said in French, war no more, war never again. But by that time, television was able to deliver this slender man with his piercing eyes into our very living rooms. And I also recall very clearly that mass that night at Yankee Stadium. And then the scene of that TWA 707 with Uncle Fulty, who my parents made me sit and listen to week after week after week. 
gushing, good night, sweet prince, as if he came up with that line himself, not Shakespeare. And then said, TWA, travel with angels, Holy Father. I would meet Paul, Pope Paul as a layman some five years after his visit to the UN. And I cannot honestly tell you whether or not I was deeply moved by him or wondering simply, what in the world would the kids on the block think of me now? Here in the presence, shaking hands and talking to a pope. Haltingly, painfully, slowly, Paul VI guided the church into an era of reflection, restoration, reform, and renewal. Some critics might say otherwise. But for the purposes of these few moments with you tonight, honesty and transparency requires that I tell you that I returned to the seminary after a decade of absence and deep doubt because of the ecclesial vision of this man and how he envisioned a church and how he shared that vision with people that were to become major figures in my life, like John Cardinal Dearden, who we knew and experienced well, Joseph Cardinal Bernadine. So folks, I owe 36 years of my priesthood and 20 as a bishop to blessed Paul VI. And I have forever been grateful that he embraced the spirit of the council as best he could and did as much as he was able. John Paul I was probably best served by God by calling him to death after only 33 days. His smile was infectious. His dialogues with Pinocchio were charming. And his Wednesday audience proclamation that God is both male and female was seismic at the time. But the burdens of office would have killed this man quickly had God not intervened first. Ordained to the priesthood in 1978 at the age of 37, I had only six months, including in the Eucharistic prayer at Mass, for Paul, our Pope. The whole world watched as Carol Wojtyla walked out on that balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, having taken the name of John Paul II. He was young, he could speak fluently five languages, and easily and phonetically communicate in a dozen more. He was from a communist country, still under the heel of atheism and communism. He was still, he was courageous and bold from the get-go. From that very first moment, he was exciting to me. And on a June day in 1979, my first year as a priest, while a young assistant pastor of a great parish in Miami, I received a call from Monsignor Hoy's boss, Bishop Thomas Kelly. General Secretary of the Episcopal Conference of the United States and a friend of mine because I had been employed at the conference as a layperson before entering, re-entering the seminary. He told me something that had only been rumored. He confirmed that the Pope was coming to the United States. This was about the 20th of June and I said, when's he coming? And he said, at the moment on the 3rd of October from Ireland. He had, Bishop Kelly told me, an invitation from President Jimmy Carter, but the invitation was limited. It would be a pastoral visit and would be announced in a matter of days. And then he said, will you come back and organize the trip on behalf of the bishops of the US who were going to foot the bill for this first ever visit officially sanctioned to the United States. I was so stupid in those days. I said to Bishop Kelly, Archbishop McCarthy will never approve my leaving in order to do this, to which Kelly replied, he already has said you could come. And then I called Archbishop McCarthy and he said, you can go, but I said, Archbishop, I love this place. He said, you can come back to it. He said, just go up and help them through 
and then come back and resume your place at St. James. Well, I was only in Washington four days. I went up on the 1st of July, and on the 4th of July, Independence Day, I got a call from Archbishop McCarthy who said, um, when you're done, would you come back and be the rector of the college seminary? Now, I was only ordained one year. I said, Archbishop, I hate seminaries. <laughs> and he said to me, well, that's beautiful, Father Lynch. That sounds like you're the perfect person. If you hate them, you can make them better. So <laughs> on July 1st, then I took up my residence in Washington and I began the planning. And shortly thereafter, I met Pope John Paul for the first of what will be, and I counted them before coming here, 31 times. Time spent with him over the entire reach of his pontificate. I don't want to dwell tonight too long on his three visits to the U.S. 1979 for six days, including Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Des Moines, Chicago, and Washington. Who that was alive and watching television can forget the picture of that Aer Lingus 747 arriving in Logan in the midst of the worst fog that Logan could possibly muster up, which caused the FAA to close down the airport. The Pope is on his way. He's on approach. I have one of these Secret Service things in my ear and a microphone, and I hear <clears throat> the FAA, I hear the tower call Aer Lingus 001, we're below minimums here. And I hear this Irish voice say, it makes no difference to me, I'm coming in regardless with the Holy Father. <laughs> the alternate was to take him back to Bangor, can you imagine? And to sit, sit on the ground in Bangor until they could fly and arrive in Boston. But they landed. And he began a trip, and we began a relationship that would last for a long, long time. Though I went to Rome twice prior to his arrival for the purpose of planning and making the final program of the visit, I had merely shaken his hand and had watched how he operated with the huge crowds that gathered in St. Peter's Square for the audiences in that July and August. The visit was a great moment for Catholicism in the United States. My dad was dead. One of the deepest regrets I had is that my father, who was born and raised in Boston, went to Holy Cross, graduated in 1922, did an MBA at Harvard, loved railroads. The New Haven was not hiring when he got his MBA, so he hired on with a coal hauling railroad in Central South called the Chesapeake in Ohio and worked for them for 41 years. I don't think my dad would ever envision his pope, our pope, being welcomed on the east and west lawn of the White House, as John Paul was on that particular visit. When he went home to Rome and I went home to Miami, I thought that the two of us, for sure, were done with each other. I walked away proud of him and his ability to preach the gospel, to play to a crowd, to embrace the desperate. He was, as his official biographer, George Weigel, called, Truly a witness of hope to all of us. But that was not to be. For in 1984, your own Monsignor Hoy asked me to come back to Washington and to be his associate. And part of the reason was there was a pretty strong suspicion that John Paul would come back for a second pastoral visit to other parts of the country. The Pope did and come again in 1987 for 10 days all across the country, and I found myself once again in the middle of these preparations. It was much harder that second trip than the first, because there were many reasons, but the major one was that both he and President Reagan had been the targets of an assassination attempt. And security was much tighter, and the demands of the Secret Service were much stricter in order to assure his protection. And even though he had been shot and had recovered, he did not like 
protection. He did not like being harnessed and told, you can't do that. In fact, the Secret Service quickly learned you didn't say that to him, you can't do that, because he turned right around and did it anyway. But rather you approached another way and said, Holy Father, we think we can accomplish what you wish to do if you'll give us a second or two to make the necessary preparations. That visit was different also, ladies and gentlemen, because the church was struggling with a number of internal issues that were infinitely more difficult than they had been in 79 and had become the target of a media interest for what they saw as dissension in our ranks, a disregard for our teaching, and even they would portray a dislike for the Pope. The bishops also wanted more from this visit from the first. They wanted more dialogue back and forth between themselves and representatives of Catholicism in America, and John Paul, rather than simply listening to his sometimes interminably long homilies and talks. He was a highly popular figure, but the bloom was a little bit off the rose. It was during this time that I began to know him better. There were several meetings with him where I was present at his table. I saw both the serious side of the Holy Father as well as the lighter side. I told the priests of Fall River when I saw them in December this story, which is classic. People always ask me, did the Pope have a good sense of humor? I can honestly say on those 30-some times that I was with him, I never saw him laugh heartily. But I saw an easy smile often come to his face, whether because of language or idiom or that type of thing, you didn't understand the nature of the humor, I don't know. But we had decided when we were in Los Angeles that we would meet the heads of the media, actors, actresses, directors, the studio bosses, anybody that fit into the highest level of media, the Holy Father would meet and address at the Sheraton Hotel that was to be found at the Universal Studios in Hollywood. And the man who was making it all possible and who was anxious for it and who footed the bill and didn't make us pay anything, very rare, uh, for the Pope's visit was a Jewish guy by the name of Lou Wasserman. And Lou opened the hotel, he opened everything for us, and as we were doing the preparatory visits with the team from Washington, we were ready to leave and Lou said to Father Tucci, who was the head of the Vatican advance team, and to myself, I have one favor to ask in return for all this. And Father Tucci said, well, would that be Lou? And Lou said, we have a ride here in our park where the people ride through and the Red Sea splits in two. Do you think the Holy Father, we could drive him there and he would be on our ride and we could film him coming through the Red Sea splitting in two. <laughs> Father Tucci said, dear boy, he'll never agree to that. But Lou said, will you ask him? So Father Tucci looked at me and said, Bob, will you ask him? <laughs> so I said, yes. So two weeks later, we we're at the Pope's table for lunch uh, in, the, in the papal apartments, and we're going over the whole program that we had worked out on their advance visit. And then we get to Los Angeles, and we're just ready to move on to the next stop in our discussion with him, which was going to be Monterey. And Tucci says, ask him. The Pope looks up from his meal, looks at me, and I said, Holy Father, a Jewish man, who has given us everything that we could possibly ask for on the event that we just described with you where we meet the media elite and all of that. He, wants, he asks one thing of you. The Pope says, what is that? And he said, I said, they have this ride, this amusement park ride, where you get in this car and you ride through and the waters of the Red Sea part, like in the Ten Commandments, which Universal had put out a number of years before, 
Would you consent to allowing to ride that car and let them photograph you as you were parting the Red Sea? Looked up at me with a smile and face said, Moses has done it already. I don't need to, I don't need to do it. Well, that was that. He said no. I'm sure that Monsignor Hoy will remember a meeting prior to his arrival here where all the U.S. archbishops as well as all of the host bishops for his visit spent two days together in Rome. Cardinal Keeler brought up the neuralgic issue of contraception in the mind of American Catholics and the encyclical letter Humanae Vitae. So there's a pretty high level discussion of what the church is really like and what he might expect with more days, more exposure, more things happening. But I remember a moment in the conversation when Archbishop Philip Hannon, who was Archbishop of New Orleans, said, Holy Father, in New Orleans we have the highest concentration of jazz in the world. Pope looks up and says, more than in Miami? And somebody said, said Jazz, not Jews, Holy Father. <laughs> well, those of you that remember those 10 days know that he came and he conquered once again. And he returned by Catholicism in the U.S. was changing. When he returned, our faith and our church was changing. But he had bigger fish to fry. It was 1987. The wall was still up. Solidarity was still pressing its case in his native Poland. And there was the communist presence to be dealt with. In 1989, I became general secretary for the next six years when Monsignor Hoy gave up the office and came home. And he came a third time under my watch in 1993 for World Youth Day. And the media once again predicted that this would be a disaster because kids didn't like him and they weren't going to welcome him and there would be, it's in Denver and the million and a half or millions that have come to see him and the other places where he had been just wouldn't be present there. He came, so did about 600,000 kids and for the closing mass close to a million people gathered together on the hottest day I can ever remember in Colorado and, and there. The cameras were there talking to the kids. Do you love the Pope? Well, of course we love him. We wouldn't be here if we didn't love him. They tried desperately to find any young person that would say something bad, and they couldn't. And they were totally frustrated by that. In 1985, the U.S. bishops first engaged the question of sexual misconduct of priests and other employees with minors. And I remember 1993, the year of World Youth Day, when our conference was dealing with the enormity of the problem and with the lack of sensitivity and response on the part of many bishops. And it was becoming a lightning rod and our leadership was certain that we needed what we call an administrative process by which priests who sexually abused children could be withdrawn from active ministry. It would not be a trial, it would be an action. And we were desperate. Bishops were desperate to do something. This was 93. We really wouldn't get a handle on this until about 2001 or 2002. But all of our cardinals and all of our elected officers asked for a meeting with the Pope himself to seek relief, to seek an administrative process whereby predatory offenders could be relieved of, of their priestly duties. I was there at the table for that, the only non-bishop present, except for the Pope's secretary. Every cardinal except Cardinal Mahoney, who was unable to be present, pleaded with the Holy Father for an administrative procedure at a lunch in the papal apartment. I was proud of them. They made the best case they possibly could for a stopgap action while we tried to figure out a better, perhaps more judicious way of dealing with this. The Pope listened, folks, for an hour and 10 minutes. And he never once interrupted, he never asked for a question of, of clarification. 
But then, when the last one had spoken, and we were finished, the Pope responded in 10 seconds. He said, quote, In Poland, the communists had many administrative procedures, but there is no justice. Close quotes. That was the end of it, folks. We lost, and we left. In my six years as General Secretary, I would be president with St. John Paul II on 14 occasions. And as he weakened, it was hard to watch. Others minded the store for him. And I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say for about the last six years of his life, he was in, unable to make the decisions that were necessary to manage the church. But he taught us how to die. He taught us, in a sense, how to bear a crippling disease of Parkinson's disease and all of the other things that were afflicting him, how to accept them. And then we had, of course, that final Easter Sunday where he tried to give a blessing in the window and couldn't mouth the words and clearly got angry and just swatted the microphone and turned around and that was the last we saw of him alive. But one of the things that I share with you tonight is my convic conviction that from his election in 1998 through his good years, John Paul II didn't really like administration. And he had a hard time dealing with hard issues that arose in the church. I saw it firsthand as we would go and ask for relief or ask for guidance of one thing or another. For one wonderful year, we had an archbishop from Australia who was called the Substitute Secretary of State. That's really the person who helps the, post, the, po the Holy Father administer and run the church part of it, not the relations with other nations. That's the Secretary of State's job. But the Substitute Secretary of the State basically runs the church, the internal affairs. That Australian lasted just a few days more than 12 months. And, he was let, and when he was let go, he was told by the Holy Father's inside secretary, you hurt the Pope when you bring him the truth. You're not good for him. We need someone else. I do not dispute John Paul II's holiness. And I really believe him to have been an incredibly saintly man in his lifetime. And I'm absolutely positive that he quickly went and joined the Father in the Father's house. But I'm a little more reluctant, perhaps, than some people to give him immediately the term John Paul the Great. I think history has to take a look at those years in their entirety. He was great in some things. And I'll summarize in a few moments those strengths that I think that he brought to bear. But running the church was not his cup of tea. And I often felt that he loved the travel because it took him away from those tough day-to-day -day decisions and difficulties that he would have to make. In the external world of geopolitics and media, he was terrific. But governing the church was not his forte, at least in my judgment. As an evangelizer, we'll likely not see his equal again in our lifetime. He could preach and proclaim the gospel and capture people's attention, respect, and admiration. He loved being on the roads. Crowds with whom he connected lifted his spirits. He brought the papacy from the shadows of the early part of my life when we had to rely on those newsreels. He brought them into our living room constantly. He would be shown in one act or speaking in one place or challenging, challenging a, a country in its direction or, or whatever. He was constantly there. And the one thing that the media could never could understand but I would go to my grave saying the young people of the world and even of the United States loved John Paul II. They loved him. I remember him fondly, but with what I hope is both a fair and realistic recollection of both his strengths and his weaknesses. History and the archives of the papacy will ultimately determine whether the word great is to be properly applied. 
It's interesting to note that neither his successor, who loved him very much, Benedict, nor Francis, has used the phrase John Paul the Great. Francis made him a saint. What more can you do? That adding another adjective is not necessarily anything like being named a saint. So while we were arguing the case that something needed to be done mostly unsuccessfully during the John Paul era about sex abuse, there was one person in his structure, in his world, in his curia, who understood it, who abhorred it from the beginning. And his name was Joseph Ratzinger, prefect of the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith. For years he was our only ally who would listen to the cries of the bishops and leaders of the church in the United States for relief and help. In my service to the church beginning in 1989 through 1995, I had many dealings with Cardinal Ratzinger, and I'm going to share a few of them with you. I found him to be the most intelligent person in the service to the Holy See. I also, and many people would dispute this or say I'm crazy, but I found him to be deeply pastoral in understanding the effects of some of the things which he and his office did. And I also found him to be more compassionate than many of his critics would probably think or allow, as they called him the Panzer Cardinal, with derision. I'll share with you one instance just to give you a sense of what this man is like, which is on the public record <clears throat> and has been told before by others rather than just solely myself. It shows you in a way, or I hope it helps you understand the challenges and difficulties that the church often faces as it puts the template of practical reality and practice up against dogmatic teaching. So let me see if I can do this for you. And then the question and answer period, I'd be happy to perhaps uh, help you in anything that you don't get. Until the early 90s, the ethical and religious directives for Catholic, Catholic health care institutions throughout the country allowed for a gynecological procedure which was known as uterine isolation. Now, let's get this straight. I'm neither a doctor nor am I a moral theologian, but I'm trying my best to explain what's involved here. When a woman has a severely scarred uterus after many cesarean sections, and the pregnancy would result in either the death of the woman or the child or both, and this is after a period of generosity and openness to children, in the early, up until the early 90s, our principles in healthcare in the U.S. allowed the doctor to isolate the Eucharist rather than to risk an invasive surgical procedure, a hysterectomy. The Pennsylvania bishops allowed it under Cardinal Kroll. The New York bishops allowed it under Cardinal Cook and Cardinal O'Connor. And many other state conferences which developed these ethical and religious directives to guide hospitals and nursing homes and other places of acute and, 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 and residual care, they have, we had these directives. And Catholic doctors and moral theologians approved of this procedure under the principles of the double effect and the lesser of two evils. Those are two complicated thoughts, and I, maybe I'll call on the other two priests that are here to help me in the question and answer point on that. But we got the word in 1991 that the congregation headed by Cardinal Ratzinger believed the procedure to be an impermissible sterilization. And therefore, as a sterilization, it had to cease in the United States. The Cardinal allowed our conference armed with the deans of the five Catholic medical schools, knowledgeable bishops and moral theologians to make the case otherwise. And the discussion ranged over several years between the United States and our conference and the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith. Finally, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith said to us in Italian, basta, enough. And Archbishop Pilarczyk and Archbishop Keeler and I went to Rome, 
knowing that we were going to be told that the procedure was immoral and had to be done away with. Cardinal Ratzinger said that his congregation meeting in plenary session had decided that it was an impermissible sterilization procedure and had to stop. And that he had personally taken the matter to Pope John Paul II, who approved of the congregation's decision. That was enough for us. You can't appeal beyond that even if you wanted to. And we'd had the longest possible discussion and I give the Cardinal credit that he allowed us to make the best case that we possibly could. Archbishop Polarczyk said that many Catholic doctors were performing the procedure thinking that they were acting morally and would need a period of catechesis to understand and to accept the new interpretation. We have a canonical term which is called a stay. It's the same thing that we hear in, court, in legal terms that there's a, there's a period that the, the uh, implementation is stayed until a certain date or a certain time or something else can happen. And I remember so clearly, so clearly, that Cardinal Ratzinger understood this. He was, he was compassionate for us. He knew what we were up against. And he said, of course, there needs to be a period of catechesis. And he looked right at Archbishop Polarczyk and he said, how long a period of catechesis do you wish this to be? Amazingly, we hadn't discussed this because we weren't, it just never occurred to us that we would be in this position. And so Archbishop Polarczyk, one of the brightest presidents that we've ever had, Archbishop of Cincinnati, just looked at Cardinal Ratzinger and said, um, how about five years? I thought, oh, he'll never say yes. And he said, five years it is. Five years it is to train your doctors, to train your healthcare personnel, and to prepare them for this change. Reasonable, the Cardinal said, the request of ours, and he gave us the time. He was always open to these requests which we made of his congregation, and he respected the work of our conference, and he asked us to undertake some things on behalf of his congregation at times. And until his retirement, every time I met him, and I was a bishop by then, he would see me and he would break into a broad smile. And in one form or another, he always said basically the same thing. You were the general secretary of the US conference. And I would say yes. And then he would smile and say, we did good things together. And I'd say, we did, Holy Father. Benedict's papacy was bound to be drastically and dramatically different from that of John Paul. He was shy and very retiring. No one from the outside was ever invited to join him for daily mass or to dine at his table. He was personally very, very, very shy. He was, after all, something like 76, I think, when he was elected. But he was kind. He was a kind pope. He was kind to all. He was ever the professor which he was before he was picked out of the, of, out of the teaching world and brought to Rome after a short period as Archbishop of Munich to be the head of the doctrine of the faith. He engaged the, les he engaged the lesson always that he was teaching but had less time for the personal which in a sense kind of made him not as much loved as I think he deserves, not as much cared for, but he had big shoes to fill and no one could have done that. I think the Spirit gave us him to fulfill something that I will close these reflections with in a few moments. If you haven't figured it out, I think the world of him. Our best moment together that is humorous was the meeting at which his secretary at the time, a Italian Archbishop by the name of Archbishop Bavoni asked the same Archbishop Polarczyk this question. Now the priests are going to laugh at this. I think Dan knows it, but this was the question that the second in command of the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith asked the president of our conference. How many internal forum solutions are done in the United States every year? Now what you need to know is an internal forum solution 
is something that can be utilized, and we don't utilize it a lot, when a case can be made that a marriage was invalid, but it can't be proven. So the person in confession comes to a priest, and they talk about it, and they, they, they hammer it out, and it is possible for that priest to say to the person, I think you may return to the sacraments because I believe that things are, believe me, we don't, we don't play loose with this. It's not something that happens a lot of. But folks, it happens in confession. So how in the name of God would you ever know how many people ask for the internal forum solution? I mean, nobody puts out statistics of how many sins you hear in confession or, or that type of thing. And at that, when Polarczyk said, Your Excellency, by their very nature, there would be no way in hell of knowing how many there are. Cardinal Ratzinger laughed and concluded the meeting with prayer, and we went on and returned to the U.S. I was happy when he was elected because I thought he would serve as a fine transition between the charismatic, dramatic, peripatetic John Paul and whomever else the Lord would send. And I think, personally, standing before you, that Benedict beautifully met my expectations and should he decease before I do, I will mourn him and his memory thankfully. So now I close with the incumbent, Francis. Yesterday in St. Peter's Square for the Wednesday audience, he stunned the world with his open invitation to all the divorced and remarried to return to the church. He reminded them that they're not excommunicated. They aren't. They can't receive, they're impeded from receiving the sacraments, but they can continue, and we should want them to continue to be a part of our community. And then he went on to buttress his case by saying, we want your children to receive the sacraments, and we want your grandchildren to receive the sacraments. And if you think you're not welcome, and if you think that you don't belong here, we're going to lose a whole generation, and we're not counting numbers because we're numbers and beans counters, we believe that we have a church with a sacramental system that helps the salvation of all. Let no one doubt that this Holy Father is pushing the envelope in a manner which neither of his predecessors would or likely ever thought of doing. And in his first encyclical letter, mostly on the environment, he pointed out that there are many factors which contribute to and will suffer from continued neglect of Mother Earth. Within our church, at least within my church, which is the central west part of, of Florida, there were voices which didn't like that encyclical at all. They said that Francis was shilling for Obama, that he was a socialist economically and politically, and that he's dangerous. Few took the time to ever read the encyclical in its entirety. That's what you usually find out. And I encourage you to do it. It's not the toughest sledding in the world compared to the encyclical letters of John Paul II. Laudato Si, the encyclical letter of Francis, is like Guppy's reader. Dick and Jane took their dog tag to school with them. I mean, it's that much, it's simpler, but it's still, it's still a little bit of a challenge. Few took the time to note that Pope Benedict had suggested much the same thing in his first encyclical letter, Deus Caritas S, and that Francis simply spilled more ink on a moral, major moral question, not just of our day, but for the future as well. Last November, Monsignor Hoy and I had the opportunity to visit the Brazilian state of Amazonia, go up the Amazon River. And I remember a little town called Parentines. You couldn't get there by road. There, most of that particular Brazilian state is not accessible, except by airplane and by riverboat. I remember sitting at a dock in Parentines and looking across the channel at the other side of the river and seeing a big plant and a big facility built by Cargill, a mostly American country. Cargill is clearing the Amazon rainforest of as much of its trees as it possibly can because it's rich and fertile soil where other things like wheat and grain that may bring more money can be, can be grown. So the trees are being torn down 
cut down and the rainforest is diminishing in size. The problem is the rainforest nourishes the river so that the trees and, and an ecosystem stands threatened by what one American major company is doing. And Pope Francis knows that a smaller, lower Amazon is a death sentence for, the inhabit, for those who inhabit its banks. The people of the little villages that we saw as we went along who depend on the river. They have no electricity, they have no phone, they have no television, they have nothing. Their whole livelihood is based on fishing and sustaining themselves by what they're able to do because of the river. And with less rain, the river will diminish in size and height and the people will have no recourse. Cargill gets richer and the Amazonian poor get poorer. It is a moral question. And this Pope is not afraid to engage moral questions like this. He has captivated the world by emphasizing mercy, sometimes in the place of judgment, by offering hospitality in lieu of exclusion, and by reminding people like myself that no one who ever approached Jesus for help or relief was subjected to 20 questions before Jesus would react and do something. You simply approached. The case was made. He was moved with mercy and compassion and pity, and he acted. And that's how Francis wants us to behave. Francis wants the vision of the Second Vatican Council restored. He wants the Holy See to be seen and to act at the service of the local churches, not be the home office or the power source for local churches. He wants genuine dialogue and engagement of all the issues that face the church, especially those that are neuralgic. He's not afraid. He's not afraid of sitting and listening to someone who tell him, I don't agree with you. He's not afraid of hearing the truth. And he is, so far, an apostle of transparency and accountability. It is too early to even think of writing the last chapters on this papacy. As a musical group of my age, and a lot of your age, the Carpenters sang, it's only just begun. So, dear friends, in brief summary, here are my personal ideas which I have attempted to share with you. In the last three popes, we have had an evangelizer, a stabilizer, and an energizer. Second, all three popes have shown the effects of the papacy on the life of the church. One through the Episcopal appointment process throughout the world. One through faithful adherence to core teaching. And one who is, quite simply, packing his electors with cardinal ecclesiastics who think as he does about the future of Catholic Christianity. The Cardinal Archbishop of Tonga, who was made a cardinal in January, has less Catholics in his archdiocese than my nativity parish in Brandon. There's, I think, 8,100 Catholics in Tonga, but they have a cardinal. In Haiti, he picked a bishop of a small diocese, not the Archbishop of port de Pay, the capital city, not the Archbishop of cap -Hétien. He picked a bishop who smells the sheep, who's out there with them and working with them. I asked a friend of mine who's a Jesuit, a bishop, and he was a bishop in Uruguay, across the Rio Plat from Buenos Aires. As a Jesuit, of course, he knew his Jesuit confrere from across the river. I said, help me make sense of him. He said, Bob, you only need to know three things. He spent every one of his days off out in the slums, working with his priests, feeding people, praying with people, saying mass for people. That's how he relaxed. Secondly, you need to read his document that he wrote for the major council at Aparecida. It's called the Aparecida document. It's a kind of a 
pastoral program for the church in Latin America. And it's full, full of Bergoliosms. You can see him coming through once you have read his writings and listened to his homilies since he's been Pope. He's not doing anything that he didn't do as Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He's just moved to a bigger stage. And thirdly, you have to know that he is a believer in what St. Ignatius thought was so important, which is the gift of discernment. You listen. You don't jump immediately and make a decision. You listen to the cries of the poor. You listen to the voices of others. You listen to those who feel oppressed and those you feel unhappy. And you quietly pray and discern what God wishes you to do. He's a Jesuit to the core of his being. Third, all three popes have drawn their personal strength from a devotion, a deep devotion to the mother of our Redeemer, to Mary. Whether it was Our Lady of Chestahova or the Our Lady of Aparecida, who is the great patroness of Brazil, or the Argentinian manifestation of the mother of God, these popes, as well as Pope Benedict, have always had a particular devotion to Mary and sought her assistance. Fourth, one should never discount the future of the Roman Curia. When they roll the stone before the tomb and all withdraw from synods, councils, congregational plenariums, the Curia remains and their presence will be felt per omnia secula seculorum till the end of time. And fifth, the papacy is integral to who we are. It defines who we are in a way. And we should be proud of it. It had its bad moments, not in our lifetime so much, but certainly in the Middle Ages, at the time of the Reformation, there were some scoundrels that got elected. But the church survived. Because when Christ commissioned Peter, he said, Lo, I will be with you all days, even to the end of time. The papacy is integral to who we are, and we've always known that. But especially now, as with St. John the 23rd, the papacy alone, it seems to me, in this moment of church history, is the only thing capable of putting new wine in old wineskins, while the wineskins themselves are reimagined. Thanks for listening. Monsignor, Monsignor Hoy, I violated your principle of being short. I'm sorry about that. So, <laughs> it's a terrible microphone. Uh, I should have said before, if you haven't been here before, the restrooms are out the door to the left. Thank God it's not too late for any of them. But. <laughs> Remember the rules as, as far as asking questions. We need to get you to speak into this microphone uh, and to avoid tripping on wires, come around this way. So if anybody does have any questions or comments, just come right around. Oh, you can, no, you can come up straight. Thank you very much, Bishop. I thought that was great, and I thought I liked the characterization of evangelist, stabilizer, and energizer. And uh, relative to that, I wanted to ask a question um, with regard to uh, Pope Benedict. And it, re it deals with um, the Society of St. Pius X. And, uh, and it seemed to me that he was very interested in bringing back together uh, that faction and, uh, and it fell apart for several reasons that would, you know, the details of which are not important for this question. But if you look at Pope Francis and you look at where the future of the church is going, how important in your opinion is it that that so-called schism gets resolved? Because I think the, the message that uh, SSPX projects is very confusing for any Catholics when they hear it. And this isn't the time that we should be so confused. Okay, that's a very fine question and well put. The Society of St. Pius X is a schismatic group that consists at the current moment of three bishops who were ordained by an archbishop who was in the diplomatic corps, actually, of the Holy See by the name of Marcel Lefebvre. And um, 
they, they are not huge, but they are significant. Now, the first thing that I would say is that I have personal knowledge, I think Monsignor Hoy could say the same thing, that Pope John Paul wanted them reconciled before he died. He really did. And he actually appointed Cardinal Ratzinger to be his point man in dealing with that society. The problem with the society is, uh, and they've never been able to reconcile this, is probably three things, just very quickly. Number one, they think the council was not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they don't believe that anything that came out of it was, was of God, all right? Secondly, they feel that, uh, that uh, the last properly elected pope was Pius XII, and that all of the rest of the popes have been uh, anti-popes. That's, they're very, kind of very clear on that, especially more so in the early days. And thirdly, um, they have a real problem with Nostra Aetate, that one section in the, uh, in the council documents that deals with the relationship between Christians and Jews and suggests, which was such a breath of fresh air, that yes, Jews can gain entrance to heaven as well. So these are foundational and fundamental parts of our post-conciliar church that can't easily be dealt away as one tries to negotiate in order to, to get the, the return of these people who are outside the church. They have tried everything. Um, there's an archbishop that works in the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith that worked for me in Washington as head of our doctorate office, Archbishop Augustine de Noia. He's a Dominican. He was given the task by Benedict to go and meet with uh, Bishop Fillet. Bishop Fillet is the principal person um, that seems that is the leader of this particular schismatic group. You will recall that one of the other bishops that was arrested by Lefebvre the same day said that the Holocaust never happened. And even they had to basically disavow uh, themselves of him. And he's not a part, and he started another church altogether now. Um, there, um, so I, I think that Francis has not made it a high priority. In fact, I know he's not made it a high priority to go out and reconcile. He's more worried about your children and your grandchildren that aren't going to church, who haven't disavowed anything, but just in a sense um, feel that they don't need church or, or they may be angry with us about one, or one thing or another. That seems to be more his focus than, than this little group. You all want to get to the Republicans, I can tell. <laughs> I think so. uh, there's a question coming, Dan. This is my grandfather coming up. <laughs> At least he has the same name as my grandfather, uh, <laughs> Thomas Clary. So. Thank you, Monsignor. Uh, Bishop, we're also, our operation is down in uh, Clearwater. Oh, okay. We know you're there. Uh, Mike, my question. Uh, he's a prisoner in Clearwater, Florida. That's my diocese. We call it God's waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he'll buy me a glass of wine someday down there. You know. uh, Bishop, my, my question concerns vocations here in the U.S., if you will, and, and celibacy in the church and, uh, and the fact that there are, as we know, married priests in the church oh, today. Oh, yeah, lots of them. Sure, and you might uh, explain that to those who are not familiar why that is. But uh, do you see the current pope addressing that issue to um, expand vocations, say here in North America and probably in Europe? And then uh, the bomb behind that is addressing women's issues and priesthood. Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether I want to thank you or not. <laughs> well, Sister Clary says that, you know, we have had uh, married priests for a long time. There have been divisions of the Eastern Rite which have allowed their priests to be married before I was born. Uh, I think it goes back even to the, well, I don't know, it's for a long, long time. 
Then the next incursion in this, as Mr. Clary uh, points out, was we began to accept uh, Anglican and Episcopalian priests and their wives and to bring them into the clergy, uh, the Catholic clergy, so that there are indeed a number of, of married priests. In the Diocese of St. Petersburg, I only have one of the pastoral provision, and he was the bishop, actually, of the Diocese of Southwest Florida, who swam across the Tiber and became a priest of, of, of our diocese. But more apropos to your question is, uh, can Catholics expect uh, a discussion on the possibility of a married priesthood? I would have said no about five years ago, but I'd be more inclined to say it's possible but not yet probable. But I think you should see progress just in moving from no to it's possible, if I'm right. And both Father Steve and, and, and Monsignor Dan can speak to that if they wish. Um, necessity has always been the mother of invention, even in the church. Uh, there have been occasions where things were done because absolutely essential. What helps us is not just our own situation in North America, but in many mission lands. For example, uh, Namibia, an African country on the east coast of Africa, was evangelized by German missionaries. They're all gone. There's practically no priests. But there are wonderful men who are catechists, who could easily, in a sense, be ordained and serve. They're married, so they're, they're impeded at the moment. But there's been a lot of thought and a lot of discussion given to that. On the question of the ordination of women, I don't see that uh, as a possibility, certainly in my lifetime or in yours, Mr. Clary. But, but I think uh, those who know church history, and you, know, you just never say never. You don't, you don't, you don't know for sure. John Paul thought that, that he closed the door forever, and Benedict reaffirmed that when he became Pope, and Francis has basically said the same thing. I, I, I embrace the teaching of my predecessor, St. John Paul II, that I don't have the power to make this change, that it's of divine origin. Still a disciplinary matter. Nobody has raised it to the level of doctrine that has to be absolutely embraced. It's a disciplinary matter which could at some point in the history. The good news is um, I just spent two days with my seminarians. In fact, I left them to fly up here. I left last night and flew out very early this morning. And I have 37. I ordained five this year. I have five next year. And then I have just one. And then I have five. My successor has five because I'm, I'll be 75 in May. And there will be a new bishop coming to St. Petersburg. So, and um, you have one of the recently ordained at St. Cecilia's and Father Kyle Smith. And they're good guys. They really are good guys. I would be happy to be a pastor with almost anyone that I've ordained in the, in the last few years. Maybe they will be the enticement, you know, to, to young men. We actually also have three women going into religious life this year, young girls, which is the first time ever in my 20 years. And I can claim no credit for it at all. It's the Holy Spirit working, you know, through other people, but it's happening. It's never gonna be enough to meet the needs of the church, at least I don't see it in the, in the near future, but we're not gonna go out of existence. And probably if there's to be a change, it will not come from the needs of the first world, but rather from the needs of the third world. He hasn't eaten. <laughs> Nor have I had a scotch. So. <laughs> the, the, one quick story, the new pastor went to Chatham and he called a meeting of the extraordinary ministers for seven o'clock at night. And they came, but one man said to him, Father, don't call another meeting at night. By four o'clock, we're, we're having cocktails. So. 
I'll just tell you one JP2 story. I was involved in a discussion when he was going to go to South Carolina. For the, that was the second visit, wasn't it? Yeah. And one of the bishops trying to brief him said, well, Holy Father, this is the first time that you're going to go to the Bible Belt. And the Pope stopped and said, I know what is Bible, I know what is Belt, <laughs> but what is Bible Belt? <laughs> I'll share another South Carolina story. The Pope and Billy Graham are standing in the, uh, at, the, at the football stadium in Columbia where the uh, University of South Carolina plays. They're standing waiting to go out onto the field for an interfaith service. And the Pope looks up and he says to Billy Graham, what is Gamecock? <laughs> and Billy Graham said, I don't know, Holy Father. <laughs> so then he looked at me and he said, what is Gamecock? And I said, mascot. He didn't anymore know mascot, but he was satisfied that that was, a, that, that that was a, a, an answer that he could live with, so. One more. That was, uh, if you was, keep going, uh, I'm going to match you one for one, so. It's up to the vice president to say goodbye to the Pope. And was that in Washington? Uh, Bush? Yeah. No, it was in Detroit. Okay. Well, Bush is there. He's the vice president. And Jeb Bush's little son at the time was there. And I can still hear <laughs> Vice President Bush saying, Holy Father, Holy Father, that one's mine, the little brown one. The little brown one is mine. Because <laughs> his mother is Mexican. So. One more story, then we're going to let you go. When, uh, w one of the great challenges when you plan a papal visit is what do you do for the Pope and the President when it comes to exchange of gifts, all right? Now, there's two parts to this story. The first part is in the first trip, the Pope, knowing that Jimmy Carter was a Baptist, John Paul gave him a beautiful Bible, a laminated Bible, you know, with, with paintings and, and all of that kind of thing. It's, it's gorgeous, it's probably worth a couple thousand bucks. Carter, because he had put in a rule that there would be, you know, no gifts more than $50, <laughs> gave the Pope a model, a plastic model of the space shuttle that the Pope would have to glue together when he got back. <laughs> when, he, when he got back to, uh, and piggybacking on that, when, when JP2 made his first visit to Africa, the ch a chief down there gave him an ivory pieta carved out of an elephant's tusk, all right? Gorgeous, gorgeous thing. So this Monsignor Hoy could tell you the Pope was never good at taking money or anything like that. He, he was always, he didn't like to do that. So he accepted the pieta and it came back and it was taken to the Vatican Museum, and you can see a lot of these gifts at the Vatican Museum, if you go, that were, that were traded. But then, after they were both shot, Reagan comes to visit the Pope um, about 11 or 12 months after they were both, the assassination, both shot. <laughs> and the Pope goes down and gives Reagan the ivory pieta <laughs> from, that the chief had given him as a gift that was supposed to be forever in the Vatican Museum, all right? So Reagan has the Carter rule that he can't accept it, so he comes back with it and he gives it to the Smithsonian, where it is exhibited until the last Christmas he's in the White House. And he gets in a car and he goes to the Smithsonian with his checkbook, and he, it was valued at being worth $47,000, he wrote a check for $47,000, and it was his last Christmas gift to Nancy in the White House. So, chief, to Pope, to Reagan, to museums, and ultimately, Nancy Reagan has it. Thanks, everybody, and good night. So. Thank you.